Shalom, and welcome to the second program in the Talking Memories series, Goas Aksyon Warsa, Remembering 80 Years Later, marking the 80th anniversary of the great deportation that began on July 22, 1942, on Tisha B'Av. The topic of today's program is the road to the Umschlagplatz, the Jewish police in the Warsaw Ghetto, with guest speakers, Dr. Katarzyna Pearson from the Jewish Historical Institute, and Noan Liebman from Moeshet, the Mordechai and Olivich Memorial Holocaust Study and Research Center. My name is Medin Shahar, and I am a guide and educator at the Ghetto Fighters House. I want to welcome our global audience with a special welcome, as always, to the survivors and their families that are with us today. We want to thank everyone for their support and interest in our programs. This program, as is the whole series, is in partnership with the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center, Classrooms Without Borders, the Rabin Chair Forum at George Washington University, Moreshet Holocaust and Research Center, the Institute for the History of Polish Jewelry at the University of Tel Aviv, the Polish Institute in Tel Aviv, and the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw. Today's program is the second in a four part series that is exploring the great deportation from the Warsaw Ghetto from different perspectives, looking at the life of the Jewish community behind the walls of the ghetto during the summer of 1942. The first program with Professor Javi Dreyfus and Holocaust survivor Pinchas Buter set the background for this series with a description of the ghetto and the mindset of the Jews entrapped inside as the deportation approached. We hope that you will join us for the next two programs in September and October. And now, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Katarzyna Pearson is a historian of Eastern European Jewish history, working in the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw, as I said, one of our partners in this series. She received her PhD from the University of London and her habil habilitation in 2020 from the Polish Academy of Science. She has held a number of fellowships at institutions, including Yad Vashem, the Center for Jewish History in New York, and the Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich. Marie Curie Individual Fellowship. She has published four books on the history of Jews in Poland during the Holocaust in the immediate post-war period, including Warsaw Ghetto Police, for which the English version was published in 2021 by Cornell University Press and the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. And with that, I would like to give Jenna the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you for this introduction. And Thank you everyone for coming. It's wonderful to be here. And I'm also very uh, happy to be able to share floor today with Noam and uh, his wonderful research on Stanislaw Kombinski. So what I'll, I'll be doing today is I'll uh, talk about the Jewish order service in the Warsaw Ghetto. And according to the, to the title of, of this series, The Road to Umschlagplatz, I will try to focus as I usually do on what's happening before the Umschlagplatz. So what does this route to the Umschlagplatz look like and how these people end up where they do and um, what we can learn from this as well. And I'll start with a quote uh, by Yehil Gurne, who was a collaborator of the underground archive of the Warsaw Ghetto. And on November 5th, 1942, so after deportations, uh, the summer of 1942 deportation from the Warsaw Ghetto, he wrote, in his diary the following. The Jewish police will perhaps try to justify we had to. We received orders to deliver such and such a number of Jews a day. The authorities threatened us with death. For a moment, I'll place myself on their side. I say that orders must be carried out, whether you are disciplined soldiers, soldier, even in the service of the enemy, when the lives of 2,000 Jews uh, are of high, of 2,000 Jewish policemen are of higher value than the life of the whole community. Is the behavior of the Jewish police during the action justified? No, and I think there will be not a single Jew who will justify or try to defend the participation of the Jewish police in the resettlement action. In stronger words, I accuse, maybe the answer the conduct. And of course, this very strong reference uh, to Emile Zola and Jacques is something that very strongly expresses his feelings about the actions of the Jewish police. And what he says is not unusual. When we look at documents written in the ghetto immediately after the, the Holocaust, they are almost uniform. 
when today we speak about the Jewish order service and the Jewish police, Jewish functionaries and concentration camp members of the Judenrat, we often refer to the category of the gray zone introduced by, by Primo Levi, this gray zone of action between the, perp, between the victim and the perpetrator. Yet when we look at writings from the ghetto, this story is not gray, it's almost uniformly black. The names of the Jewish policemen, if they appear in the immediate postal years, they're usually written as an act of revenge in names of those who perished. The names are written down as perpetrators rather than as victims. The documents written in the ghetto immediately after are almost uniform act of accusation, like the one written by Yehiel Gurne against the actions of the ghetto police. But what I want to do today is to look at it a bit differently, to see how this group evolves, to see how they are part of the internal dynamics of life in the Warsaw Ghetto, to see them as subjects to the Nazi anti-Jewish policy, and also see them as, as those who are subjected to the reactions of the Jewish community towards, uh, towards the implementation of this policy. And I should probably start by, by talking about the Judenrat a little bit, because uh, when we talk about the Jewish police, we often also speak about the Judenrat, and they usually mention one breath. But what we should remember is that they're not exactly the same. The Judenrat is set up already in September 1939 with the invasion of Poland on the basis of Reinhard Heinrich Schnellbrief. And its aim is to deal with the, uh, is to be made full responsible in the literal sense of the word, for the exact execution according to terms of all instructions released or yet to be released. So the Judenrat is set up in all larger Jewish communities in occupied Poland before and then elsewhere as well, before the ghettos are being set up, while the Jewish police is a part of the ghetto. It is set up as a subordinate to the Polish state police, so Policja Granatowa, or blue police, and is officially responsible for maintaining order in the newly created ghettos. In many ghettos, especially largest ones like Warsaw, it is often based at least slightly on an already existing paramilitary organization, uh, which is aiding the Judenrat in um, catching and escorting prisoners to forced labor. So it's not also by definition independent organization, it's an auxiliary service that performs tasks imposed on it by the German administration, the local Polish police, and the Judenrat. Since unlike in case of the Judenrat, there are no top-down regulations regarding the functioning of the Jewish order service. And since it's being set up in different times, as ghettos are being set up in different times and has a bit different character as ghettos are, dif are different, there are also significant, uh, significant differences in the functioning of the units in different locations. For example, its relationship to the Judenrat, the Polish police, and the German authorities as those three bodies supervising it. In Warsaw, which I'll show in a moment, the head of the public, of the Jewish police is a high-level pre-war member of the Polish police that has particularly close links to the Polish police. In other ghettos, where there's a number of people who are collaborating with, with the German authorities within the police structures, like in Krakow, it has much closer links to German authorities. In other places, especially smaller ghettos, where there's no clear German presence and also no strong uh, Polish police, uh, police network, it can have much closer links um, to the Judenrat. But what they all share, irrespective of, of how they function and how they fit within the community in which they are set up, because of course they function differently in larger ghettos like in Warsaw, and differently in smaller ones. Uh, what they all share is that they are primarily used to first uh, conduct roundups for forced labor, to collect contributions, to guard the ghetto borders if there are borders, and in many cases participate in the last stage of the existence of the ghetto. In case of Warsaw, uh, to participate in deportations to death camp. In other, uh, in other cases, maybe one way or another, aiding as an auxiliary service during uh, executions of ghetto inhabitants. And the story of the Warsaw police uh, begins on September 20th, 1940. 
So a month before uh, the three weeks before the uh, the ghetto is set up, the city governor of occupied Warsaw unexpectedly calls in Adam Czerniakow. Adam Czerniakow is the head of the Judenrat in Warsaw, as you that probably know. Um, he's then 59 years old, an engineer, a social activist, uh, and also as we see him today, because of course his image, just the image of the Jew Jewish order service, it fluctuates and changes in time. But as we see him today, a very capable administrator, a man who was very skillfully maneuvering between German demands and the needs of his own community. So um, Czerniakov is called in and told uh, to establish a Jewish order service, a Jewish police force that will be the Jewish equivalent of the Polish Blue Police and part of the quote unquote Jewish autonomy in the plant ghetto. He officially receives the order on October 12, 1940, together with the information about the creation of the Warsaw Ghetto. And the next day, the Judenrat set up, sets up a commission to oversee the selection of future members of the service. And of course, the, the most important decision they have to make is who will be the head of the new service. So who will be the person, the man in this case, responsible for setting up in a very short period of time, a service, a police force, uh, a paramilitary police force, which will uh, serve the newly created uh, Jewish uh, quarter. And in many respects, they are very fortunate to have a perfect candidate. And the perfect candidate is Josef Sharinsky, who we can see on this picture, a man with, of great ambition and talent, born in 1895 uh, as Josef Schenkman from 1920, member of the Polish state police, and immediately tasked with the, uh, with the duty of setting up Polish police force in Upper Silesia. So a man who has already experienced from very early on in setting up new police forces. In 1929, he becomes the head of the press department, the first head of the, of the press department of the main police headquarters in Warsaw. So he becomes the first spokesman of the, uh, of the Polish pre-war state police, and then very quickly goes up the ranks. Even though there are people who claim in the ghetto that he was um, alienated and unhappy as the only Jew with, uh, such, of, at such a high level in the Polish state police, this doesn't seem to be true. It's actually, his career is actually progressing very quickly considering his background, his education, and his actually lack of, of military uh, experience. And he seems to find himself very well in the structure of the, uh, of the Polish state police. Of course, the Polish state police after the war becomes the blue police. Hence, he has very close and very good personal links to members of the, uh, of the blue police uh, also during the war. So Sharinsky is a perfect candidate in every aspect other than one. Uh, and that's the one that's of course decisive and that's the fact that he's baptized. Uh, he's baptized that what allowed him to, uh, to have this uh, extremely successful career in the Polish state police. And he is an alien in the Warsaw ghetto. He's completely alienated from the ghetto community. That's something that comes across very clearly in testimonies from, uh, from the Warsaw ghetto. And it's not only because of his position in the ghetto, but also because of his complete lack of uh, relationships with uh, with uh, Warsaw ghetto community, Warsaw Jewish community from before the war. So understandably, and that's really what shapes the image, not only the image, but also the, the way that the Jewish police works in Warsaw, he surrounds himself with people like him, with people he can trust, with people he can understand and he can have uh, put trust in. And these are mainly highly assimilated lawyers, uh, often people with truly wonderful uh, pre-war careers, people with very high standing in the community, both Polish and Jewish, and, uh, but nonetheless, people who are highly assimilated. And these people form the corpus of officers of the, of the Jewish order service. And once this is set up, they start searching for a rank and file policemen. The conditions for admission are age from 21 to 40 years old, completion of six grades of uh, secondary school, uh, adequate health, height of at least 170 centimeters, weight of at least 60 kilograms, complete military service, 
as you can imagine, none of these conditions are actually always met. Uh, there's impeccable past, so no criminal records, something that cannot be checked in the ghetto. And finally, something that can be checked and that's really becoming the, the basis on the on base of which the policemen are admitted in the service, and that's references from two people well known in the district. So in reality, those who are admitted in the service are admitted on the basis of protexia. Later also, high bribes come in very handy. So uh, the recruitment, as we know, attracted enormous, uh, enormous interest. There are thousands of people who are showing up to the recruitment point. And when it's completed in uh, January 1941, there's 2,000 members of the, uh, of the Jewish order service. That's 2,000 people who are members as such. This number fluctuates, and I'll speak about it in a moment, through the existence of the ghetto. But this is, of course, not the finite number of people who are linked to the Jewish order service. That's 2,000 men who are members. But on top of it, of course, there are also the families and there are a number of other people who are admitted in various auxiliary services by the service itself. So people who are employed as typists, secretaries, doctors, cleaners, cooks, and especially messengers. Messengers, uh, people who are employed into messengers are mainly young boys from uh, wealthy families whose parents managed to get them into the service. One of them who was a son of a businessman from Volkswagen, uh, recounting his work after the war, described it as a quote, as delivering various communications from one place to another, instructions of various forms, dusting, cleaning. It was really a phony appointment. I, I think I primarily got this appointment from my father's connections with some other people. And he was, of course, right, uh, as were others. Uh, the employment in the service remained attractive through the existence of the ghetto. And it's something very important we'll think about, um, about how, ghetto, how the service was perceived and whether being in it was better or not than not being in it, undoubtedly it will, remained a very attractive option, of course, mainly due to the fact that uh, being in the service allowed one to be safe from uh, forced labor. And the specter of forced labor was counting. The, but anyway, the, the forced labor was something that was hanging over people in in the Warsaw Ghetto, a young man. And the fact that being in the Jewish police secured one from, uh, from enlistment to, into forced labor was something that remained the key when it comes to, to the attractiveness of, of any vacant places in the Jewish uh, order service. Hersh Wasser, who was the secretary of, of Ringel Markive, wrote at that point that any vacant place in the Jewish order service was valued its weight in gold. Another diarist from the ghetto wrote that prices for a place in the service were widely known and that and they were listed on quote unquote ghetto stock exchange. As was the case in uh, other ghettos, uh, members of the service were not uniformed. The attribute that immediately distinguished them from, uh, from the rest of the other ghetto inhabitants that became the symbol of the service was the hat with the rank and education of the policemen marked on it. They also had a specific armbands with the uh, insignia of the Jewish order service and, uh, and service numbers displayed on their outer uh, garments. On November 16, 1940, so less than a month uh, after, the get after the service was set up, the first members of the service went out. Uh, on the street. The newly created service was, as I already repeated numerous times, um, referred to as the Jewish order service and wasn't a coincidence. The German administration had tried to emphasize this way its subordinate position to the blue police, so the real police in Warsaw, and also underlined that of the three areas that were within the scope of duties of pre-war policemen, so general order keeping, fighting criminality and, pro and protecting the state system, it was only general order keeping that was within the duties, at least officially within the duties of the Jewish order service. Uh, the duties of the order service were uh, specified in use of Sharinsky's order of November, December 23rd, 1940, and 
uh, you can see them here. As you can see, these were mainly what we really refer today as uh, as simple order duties, though it has to be taken into consideration. They are carried out in the full horror of the of the ghetto reality by people who are usually completely unprepared for these tasks. So what looks on paper is pretty simple uh, tasks of overseeing cleanliness of pavements and roads or uh, regulating pedestrian traffic on the streets, of course, has to be looked at within the context of the overcrowding um, um, and, and general turmoil of, of um, everyday ghetto life. Permanent posts for the Jewish policemen were also created uh, near the ghetto walls. So these are the ones that we most commonly associate with the duties of the policemen. Uh, the numbers of Jewish order service policemen on the ghetto by the ghetto walls depended on the traffic they were doing in uh, in free shifts. So the, the duty included standing by the ghetto walls, but also patrolling the walls from the inside, making sure there were no holes made by smugglers, and also removing bodies of people who were murdered when trying to cross the boards, trying to uh, cross, uh, cross the walls illegally. And of course, the key duties that the Jewish police had to really carry out on top of everything that's mentioned here were those involved the assistance service uh, to the Judenrat and uh, resulted from subsequent and constantly growing, increasing demands of the Germans. And this included rounding people up for forced labor, escorting groups to forced labor sites, securing the ghetto walls, which I already mentioned, assisting requisitions of various types of contributions as well as monitoring blackouts and anti-aircraft defense at night. So when we speak about the Jewish police and when Jewish police is mentioned, it's often mentioned in context of this superficiality of ghetto life. We think about it for the prism of corruption, violence, but not really what these people have to do every day. Well, as we see here, their daily duties were actually very real. Uh, they were constantly exposed at illnesses as well, of course, with ghetto being constantly ridden. Uh, with typhus, they were in the first line when it comes to German violence. They were actually the people in the Warsaw Ghetto who for the very long time were the only ones who had constant direct uh, contact with the Germans and who were in the, uh, in the first line when it comes to the violence. And there is actually, we have reports regarding death rate of, of the Jewish policemen, and it's not insignificant. And I think it's clear that it comes both from uh, exposure to typhus firstly, and secondly, also exposure to violence uh, on the uh, ghetto walls. Moreover, it should be remembered that organizational status of the Jewish order service clearly prohibited uh, corruption. Members, and I quote now, acting for the purpose of obtaining property or personal benefits for himself or for other persons, and those who, and I quote again, assume or benefit from financial gain or its promise for himself and another person were to be penalized. In reality, however, as was the case in the Polish law police, collecting large or smaller amounts during daily duty became the main source of income for policemen and was reluctantly, but nonetheless tolerated both by the Judenrat, by the German authorities and by the leadership of the Jewish order service. When we read diaries from the Warsaw Ghetto, and those testimonies written before the deportation even we can see that the corruption of the Jewish order service truly affected everyone, from businessmen from whom the money was taken in an almost mafia type manner, to ordinary people who were forced to pay constant bribes for various uh, small tasks they wanted to carry out. The, those, uh, this corruption was also uh, growing when in, in the gossips which are circulating in the ghetto. We have numerous, numerous examples of, uh, of course, uh, proven anyway, gossips regarding the growing greed uh, of the Jewish policemen, mainly during disinfection of apartments, disinfection actions, which were a way of uh, combating, apparently, though it completely didn't work out, combating the typhus epidemic uh, imposed by the by the German authorities were one of the key uh, places where uh, bribes were being taken, and also the ghetto walls, where bribes were taken both from big smugglers and from individual people who were trying to to illegally pass the goods for the 
uh, through the ghetto walls. An important part of this, uh, of this growth of corruption was of course the fact that there was an open tolerance for such uh, practices and in time even grow, grow pressure in this regard, which led to the development of specific patterns of bribery. One member of the Center Brigade who worked with the Jewish Order Service explained in his account in the Ringel, Mark, uh, in the Ringel Mark, so account again taken before deportation started. He said, he wrote, although I found myself in such material conditions that I did not feel compelled to earn something on the side, I looked at my colleagues with a certain envy when they were bragging about their achievements with a smile on their faces. And I exhausted more than anyone else, went home with my tail between my legs. Gradually I became used to taking money. The soaring prices made me aware of how much I needed. What also comes clear, I think, in this, in this testimony, when he writes about being exhausted more than anyone else, is the fact that policemen were aware of the risk, the health and the life. And the fact that the risk they were taking was of course much larger than that of the officers who would normally take the larger, larger part of the, of the bribes and who also, unlike the rank and file policemen, had regular income, regular salary in the service. The policemen who were at the bottom ranks were not paid. Uh, they were getting some sort of aid every now and again, but they weren't paid regularly, while the officers were getting a uh, regular salary and this enormous financial gap between ordinary policemen and high level officers was something that was also contributing uh, to the growth in, uh, in bribery and also belief that those people also uh, deserve to be, to be taking money. Uh, Tadeusz Witelson, who was a uh, collaborator of the of the Regal Markup, the Underground Archive, the Warsaw Ghetto, explained it in a study on the Jewish Order Service. He was writing about his own uh, personal situation. Uh, he wrote, for a year and a half, we have been working for free. Our children are starving and freezing. We are literally dying from exhaustion and lack of vitamins and food while our managers and commanders get salaries for themselves and they tell us to survive on air. Even taking into account the manner in which recruitment has been carried out, one has to side with very numerous, completely pauperized and ruined refugees, many intelligentsia, who are forced into unpaid heavy labor for the second year running, while hero heroic sacrifices and starvation is demanded from them. And who demands that? People have everything and better than before the war. People have no right to condemn or judge others. Corruption, as you can see, was therefore an important of an important part, a part of daily lives and, and duties of the of members of the Jewish Order Service. But it was also clearly, together with violence, inscribed by the uh, by the German authorities into its uh, into its daily lives. I think it comes, it's pretty clear if we are to sum up this aspect of their functioning that the Germans in the Warsaw Ghetto acted like they did in concentration camp. Uh, camps according to the divide and rule principle, and they undoubtedly used and magnified divisions in the ghetto as an instrument of social disintegration with victims forced to play, play the role of uh, persecutors. In a letter to Berlin dated November 24, 1941, uh, the commissar of the Warsaw Ghetto, Heinz Auersfeld, noted, and I quote, when conflicts occur in the ghetto, the Jewish population directs their discontentment primarily against the Jewish administration, not the German authorities. And this situation also comes through very clearly in personal accounts. There's no doubt that Jewish policemen were often blamed, if not always blamed, for carrying out German orders. Uh, and the duties not only involve violence, uh, and violence was written in those duties, but also, just as importantly, it was violence was fully visible. And that was really the only violence that was visible to ghetto inhabitants with uh, uh, members of the German administration staying outside at least until the spring of 42 outside the ghetto. So the Jewish police is described in uh, even before deportation as something that's alien to the ghetto community, something that remains outside of its uh, of its circle of responsibility, let's say. Uh, and moreover, something that very quickly becomes both physical danger and the threat to the unity of the, uh, of the ghetto community. 
Yet one officer wrote that despite the general hatred of the Jewish order service, and I quote now, there was an exception in thousands of houses, husband, father, brother, son, nephew, cousin, brother-in-law. This one does not allow vicious acts, he's different. So family members and close friends, when we look at testimonies from the ghetto, are always described as the honorable exceptions. Others, even if they're friends, even if they are from the same social circles, from the moment they put the cap on, they become part of this faceless, hostile, and hated collective of the Jewish or the service. So the policemen were perceived as strangers because of the assimilation or considered to be assimilated uh, because uh, the community declared their behavior as offensive and also, of course, because they were strangers, because they were part and the only visible part really for many months of the foreign authority imposed on the ghetto. So the question which arises here, and I keep looking at time, um, the question arises here is why would someone stay in the service? Why would people want to be members of the other service? And there are numerous reasons for that. Of course, the one of, of security from forced labor is one of them. Uh, the fact that in time there is less and less employment opportunities, and that really is uh, the only way of making some sort of Man, some sort of living and providing for one's family is another, but there is also another phenomenon that's taking place. And that's really the phenomenon of closing ranks and of um, police becoming an organization. We often talk about the Warsaw ghetto, ghettos in general, in terms of upending of social structures, but also new structures which are being set up within the ghetto. And one of such structures is uh, the Jewish order service and the Jewish police, which is increasingly closing in ranks and it's being increasingly ruled by its own strong binding factors which are separate from from the rest of the ghetto community uh, one uh, female relative of one of the policemen wrote in her memoir published uh, after the work of this phenomenon she wrote he found among them many pre-war friends so among other policemen Many pure friends and all their meetings inevitably ended in vodka drinking or supper in a restaurant because there was always someone who wanted to get an additional star and was willing to entertain them and be seen in the company of high ranks. They exchanged jokes, discussed politics, local news, who was doing well at smuggling and who was successful at the war, and then told stories about the Germans. All policemen had permits to stay at night after the curfew, and so after the meetings lasted, and so, and so the meetings lasted late um, into the night. And Raoul Hilbert was actually writing about the search for normalcy as one of the aspects of, uh, of uh, communal life during the Holocaust that allowed people to do what they did. And undoubtedly, policemen were also such people. They were also looking for normalcy and this office and the hat and the fact they could work, leave the apartment every morning and then work with their pre-war friends was an important factor why they stayed in the policemen. In the, in the service. And the question which arises, and I think we still haven't quite found answer to it, is how this gradual development into an insular group, even before the deportations take place, affect the policemen. So how do they function within those dual pressures? Because they often look and describe themselves um, as soldiers on the front of fighting. Uh, they, they, there's a soldier-like drill and um, and they do see themselves to a large degree as soldiers, but they're not soldiers because they're not on the front anywhere. They are still sleeping in their own beds. They still have their families around them. And how those two pressures work on individual policemen, the pressure of the group and the pressure of the family on the other side, is I think something that still awaits to be fully explored. But all of this story ends on, uh, on July 22nd, 1942, on the Umschlagplatz, or rather in the building of the Juden at that point, where uh, the uh, where Hermann Heffler, who was uh, the head of Operation Reinhardt was also reads out the Deportation Act to Adam Chernyakov, members of the Juden Rat, and Jakub Leikin, who was at that point the acting head of the Jewish Order Service. And the order stipulates that the Jewish Order Service is to serve as an executive organ of the Juden Rat responsible for carrying out the deportations. In return, the family, immediate family members are accepted from deportations. And that's where the story of the Jewish order service, what we most often think of, begins. From the day on, day on the Jewish order service is bringing, that's actually another picture of it from the 
but it's a picture from still before deportations. But uh, from the day on, the Jewish Order Service brings 6,000 people to the Umschlagplatz. Uh, every day, they get the address of the night before and conduct roundups, roundups of buildings. We have, of course, uh, numerous uh, testimonies regarding it and uh, almost all testimonies from, from deportation to small or large degree focus on the actions uh, of, the, of the Jewish order service. Uh, what is particularly remember is the, uh, is the situation from August 1942, from which point, uh, aside from conducting uh, roundups, aside from escorting the police to the Uschlagplatz and uh, taking our 24 hour, uh, taking over 24 hour watch uh, on the Umschlagplatz also have to bring a, actually a certain number of people to the Umschlagplatz. And uh, from then on, they are often referred to as catchers. There are numerous references to Jewish history in, in, uh, in descriptions in descriptions from the uh, from these times on August 6th, so around the same time when the order regarding the number of people it's meant to be brought in by, by each individual policeman is, uh, is uh, passed, they are moving in to a separate, uh, to a separate building, uh, which is uh, surrounded by uh, a barbed wire. And from that time as well, this separation between the Jewish order service and the ghetto is truly complete. Uh, they, the nightmare of deportations and the relative, as it seems to the ghetto inhabitants, because of course we know it's not true, as we know we have testimonies from actually from the, uh, from the policeman blog, but the difference between the horrors of the ghetto and the relative calmness of the, of the uh, buildings where the policemen are stationed is something that again appears constantly in, uh, uh, in testimonies. Around that time, there's also a growth in attacks on, on policemen, which are carried out both by individuals during the catchings and also by, uh, by the other underground, starting with uh, the unsuccessful assassination attempt at Judith uh, Sarinsky, followed by a subsequent more successful attempts and assassination of, of top policemen especially most famously or infamously, uh, Jakub Leikin. But at the same time, the policemen are st starting to gradually uh, share the fate of the ghetto. They are, they are being deported group by group together with, with the rest uh, of the ghetto inhabitants. In January 23rd, Josef Sharinsky commits suicide. The, again, the situation which of course mirrors the suicide of Adam Chernyakov, the first day of the deportation. And, um, the rest, the remaining members of the Jewish Order Service are uh, murdered during the beginning, uh, during the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising in April uh, 1943. And the post-war story of the Jewish Order Service, I know we don't have time now. Okay, now actually I'm running out of time. But uh, the post-war story of the, of the Jewish Order Service is also, I don't know the word fascinating is right here, but it's also incredibly, incredibly interesting. As we know, almost immediately at the end of the, uh, of the war, Jewish newspapers, political parties, social organizations are flooded with denunciations from those who consider themselves to be victims of, of Jewish policemen and, and their, and their uh, families who are still alive, and as well as those who, uh, who oppose the participation in public life of people suspect of collaboration. This leads to a series of, uh, of, uh, of trials, both by the state courts all around the world, wherever the policemen end up living, especially in Poland and Germany, uh, where, they are, uh, where they are in DP camps, as well as various types of informal courts, so social courts, honor courts, religious courts, professional courts, who are trying and retrying in many cases, in many cases, numerous times, uh, members of the Jewish order service. And despite all that, of course, many of them live with the stigma of, uh, of membership in the Jewish order service for the rest of their lives. Uh, of the lives. What happens uh, in scholarship is of course the fact that we now, we have passing generations and passing generations of scholars, there has been a clear shift in the uh, in the perception of the Jewish order service, and I think it's something that also came out quite clearly, uh, 
in my lecture. So from this blanket condemnation of the Emir Posoyes to an approach which tries to understand the social dynamics which, which rule their actions. As uh, in describing the labor camp in Strachowice, Christopher Browning wrote that Nazi power plays Jews in less than zero sum game, in which they had some agency of choice, but all choices caused harm to many and no choice guaranteed saving the lives of anyone. So in the situation of, uh, of life, uh, in the situation, the life of those family members who remained still alive became the highest imperative. And that's something that's very clear when we look at the actions of the of the Jewish police on the Umschlagplatz, where they're given the chance to save themselves and to save their immediate family members and are often ready to pay any price of this. And of course, part of the price is the fact that they are rejected by the community, not only then, but also for many years after that. But I think the key lesson that we, lesson, but the key, um, what we really take out of it is that in the end, all strategies of survival are futile. So those who survive ascribe it more often than not to chance rather than to conscious choices. And I think the fate of the Jewish policemen also shows it, that the service became tall and finally with the destruction of the Warsaw Ghetto, like everybody else, a victim itself to the Holocaust. Thank you very much, Katarzyna, for your presentation. Uh, there are so many questions in the chat box. I know we won't be able to get to all of them, but I'm trying to keep track, so a little patience, because we are going to move on to the next speaker who will deal specifically uh, with one specific uh, person in the uh, OP. So first of all, thank you again. Um, and I want to introduce our next speaker. Noam Liebman is a PhD candidate in the Jewish History Department at the University of Haifa. He is writing his dissertation under the supervision of Professor Marco Silber and Professor Guy Meron. He holds a master's degree from the University of Haifa's Department of Jewish History, for which he was awarded summa cum laude. His thesis explored Jewish policemen's memoirs in the ghettos of Warsaw and Odwok. I, mean, I hope I'm saying that right, Odwok. Uh, Liebman has been working at the Education Department of Moreshet, the Mordechai and Levitch Memorial Holocaust Study and Research Center again, one of our partners for the series, and he's been there since 2008, and is currently the head of the education department. His article, indeed, merely a description of the events, the memoirs of Jewish Warsaw ghetto police officer Stanislav Gombinski as a model for Hermeneutic analysis was published in the Moreshet Journal 18 in English and 101 in Hebrew. So with that, I want to give the floor to no one. Good evening, and uh, thank you, Medin. Thank you, Katarzyna, for like always your interesting talk, and thank to all the partners uh, of this series. Uh, Katarzyna gave us a comprehensive uh, view of the Jewish order service, uh, which allows me to focus on one story of one Jewish uh, police officer from Warsaw, Stanislav Gombinski. I will start by presenting uh, a short biography of Gombinski, then I will try to show and demonstrate Gombinski's narration uh, of the Great Deportation and the argumentation accompanying it. Uh, important credit should uh, be mentioned uh, is that all photos that I'll use in this presentation are from the Jewish Historical Institute and or from uh, Ghetto Fighters House Archive. Uh, Sonisov Gombinski was born in 1907 in Wroclawek. Uh, in some sources, there is 1906. Uh, he became a doctor of law in 1930. Still, he did not complete his uh, certification as an attorney because the regulation of the Minister of Justice on closing the list uh, of advocates throughout the Polish state. He married uh, Stanislav Solnitsky and the couple had two children. Kombinsky didn't mention his family in his memoirs at all, but they were probably hiding in the Aryan side of Warsaw. When the war, uh, war uh, broke out, uh, Gombinski was living in Warsaw. He volunteered for uh, the army, the Polish army, and was injured. Uh, after the move uh, into the ghetto in November 40, he joined the Jewish ghetto police where he worked in Division I organization and administration. And after uh, he achieved the status of a senior officer uh, as the head of the secretariat of the Jewish order service. 
His job involved actually office work for the most part. As a result of his position and due to his connection with Yusuf Sharinsky, commander of the Jewish police uh, in the Warsaw Ghetto, he was familiar to some extent uh, with the decision-making processes within the Jewish police and also in some way within the Judenrat. It's worth, uh, worth uh, mentioning that Gombinski was also House Committee member and involved in the distribution of PPR uh, underground newspaper. Following the action uh, of January 1943, he left the police and soon after left for the Aryan side of the city where he went into hiding. Uh, he and his family survived the war and uh, after moved to Paris where he lived until his death on uh, 1983. While hiding on the Aryan side, he wrote two versions of his memoirs in, in Polish. Uh, the two versions were written in close chronological proximity to one another, just a few months apart. Uh, Gombinski addresses uh, the period uh, in both uh, of the Warsaw Ghetto. The whole story of why he wrote twice and the differences between them is really behind the scope of this book. Sorry about it. Uh, the originals of both versions are located in the Ghetto Fighters House archive. Uh, the second version was published in Polish in 2012. For many years, the uncertainty uh, surrounded the identity of the author of one of the versions, but with the assistance of Noam Rachmilevich from Ghetto Fighters House Archive, Javi Dreyfus was the first to publish the, uh, the fact that Gombinski was the author of the text in question. Um, indicative of the importance of Gombinski memoirs is that at least one of its versions has been mentioned by studies on the Jewish police uh, in the Warsaw Ghetto. Gombinski memoirs are also quoted in studies dealing with the Warsaw Ghetto from a broader perspective to help researchers convey the organizational structure uh, of the Jewish police as well as its uh, attire, its uh, internal hierarchy and other aspects. Indeed, his memoirs uh, are sometimes the only source of description for organizational part of the activity of the Jewish police uh, and have become a sessional source for research, despite uh, reservations about the reliability of, the Jewish, uh, of a Jewish police officer writing after the degradation of the ghetto for readers for, of the future. Uh, to address this aspect of a reliability issue uh, in the case of Gombinski, I would like to quote from War Time Memoirs written by another uh, Jewish police officer in the Warsaw Ghetto, Stanislaw Adler. Adler uh, was uh, subordinated to Gombinski. He criticized Gombinski and actually mocked him. However, he also considered him a good person. Gombinski told as a perch a pre-war law student in a second-rate legal office, well-read, witty, intelligent, and what was most important, man of rare honesty, but did not possess sufficient administrative or legal experience. Sharinsky, uh, quickly discovering Gombinsky incompetence, uh, was obligated, in spite of his original intentions, to relieve him of some of his duties. After several months of uh, fruitless efforts, Gombinski drew the correct conclusion and accepted the fact that he was not, uh, that he was unsuited to the position uh, to which he had been appointed. This was testimony to his fine character. Indeed, he always distinguished himself by his European, European manners in the best sense of the term, by his sincerity, truthfulness, and lack of servility to Sharinsky, and most importantly, his realization of the gravity of our situation and the need for brotherly compassion toward the people of our unfortunate community. Now I want uh, to move forward to the main issue of this talk. To start with, how did Gombinski see the role of the Jewish order service uh, during the Gert deportation? Gombinski claimed that the Jewish order service headquarters became a central cell, the center of the ghetto. There, there was the life center of the ghetto where all threads uh, and all issues converged. The Jewish council, uh, the community, I mean the Jewish council, has been relegated uh, to the shadows. He even called the police officer masters of the street, but soon he clarifies by adding 
the Sonderkommando makes all decision, i.e. the Germans. Following this, it will repeatedly write that the uh, SS are the masters of the ghetto. So the Jewish order has its role, but it's not a significant one. Gombinski divided the reaction of the Jewish policemen into four groups. The first, the brutal greedy who work hard to find the hidings. The second, those who get benefits and bribes, but avoid particip participating actively in the deportation. The third, those who stay in the shops close to their families. And the fourth, the few who left the Aryan side. Gominski criticized the first, explaining that not everybody acted the same way. Nevertheless, how did he address the others? Not to take part in the deportation would have been a good system if it was an overall position. But in the conditions of the time, it was possible only because others did the dirty work. For these few dozens or hundred or so to possess their comfortable pose of pseudo-passive resistance, a necessary condition was that several hundred took part in the action every day. Both of these people later, but I did not take part in the action. I was not once in the Umschlag. And Gombinski adds, it was not a title to fame that some policemen had not been on the Umschlag even once. It should have been. He added that there were policemen who lost their life while trying to help people or to slow down the action. Of course, you can see your contradiction. What he wrote about also requires kind of others to do the dirty work. Kombinsky wrote a lot about the police elite and the way it functions. He was aware of the criticism against them, but he stayed loyal to, his, uh, to a principle he declared, I quote, my memoirs are definitely an indictment against the only real culprits, again, the Germans. Regarding Sharinsky and the critics, toward him, Gombinski wrote, those who knew Sharinsky more intimately think differently, but their opinion does not matter to the public. The public is still far from objective judgments. This task will remain for the future. For now, the public must have an object of its hatred, a visible symbol of evil. He seeks to address different people specifically without generalizing or including the functioners. For example, Gombinski, for example, from another side, Gombinski wrote uh, about Mieczysław uh, Schmerling that he was a cruel dictator who abused people. Interesting example is Gombinski's attitude toward Lakin. Gombinski wrote that before the deportation, no one blamed Lakin for abusing or misappropriating functioning in his job. Uh, being corrupt or trying to look after his benefit. According to Gombrinsky, it was true that Lakin acted cruelly during the deportation and was devoted to realizing uh, the orders from the Germans, but this is only because he thought that his job as a policeman was to carry out the Judenrat's orders. He honestly believed, according to Gombrinsky, that quick and efficient execution of the deportation would save at least part of the Jewish public. Uh, Lakin fate, according to Gombinski, is an example of the Jewish strategy in this period. For this mistake, he suffered a tragic punishment. The tragedy uh, of the punishment lies in the fact that a brave, eminently uh, capable man died in, uh, as the universally hated executor of his fellow brothers. With a different turn uh, of events, Lakin could have done much, much for the world Jewry. Indeed, tragic, sad history and tragic, sad death. In another place, he wrote, this is not a defense uh, of the accused Jakub Lakin. It is the truth, maybe subjective truth, maybe very personal impressions, but this is not whitewashing the black, closing eyes to the facts, uh, um, falsify falsifying reality. Gombinski attitude, uh, to Lakin's story as a tragedy, and likewise to the level of the Jewish order service and the youth act, is interesting. In my opinion, it's not by accident, this word of tragedy. Gombinski wanted future readers to understand Jewish reality as a tragedy. But a scholar like Gombinski, uh, who wants to use historical and literally image, knows uh, what tragedy is. 
It is a situation in which the individuals subjected to uncontrollable instincts, and more importantly, in the end, the catastrophe is known and it's impossible to change it. The individuals are trying to overcome this predictable ending or avoid it, but the disaster is that all their attempts can't bring any results. Hence, according to Gombinski, the Jewish policeman is kind of played by the fate, also during the deportations. The critics of the policemen against the Judenrat during the deportation were focused first and foremost on the aspect that the Judenrat did not understand the nature of the deportation. And if they understand it, they didn't share the information, didn't warn the Jewish community, and didn't try to help. There has been no spreading of knowledge about this. No position has been taken. No public opinion information has been initiated in connection with these events. No conclusions, no warnings, no lesson has been learned, have been learned. No thought has been given to, the, um, to how the Warsaw Ghetto should act when its turn comes. This I cannot understand. Gominski also wrote about the policy pattern that in his opinion, can't be separated from what has happened during the deportation. Jewish policy has followed this line for nearly three years, the theory of leisure of two evils. There, uh, there are no other voices, no outcry, no protest. Silence are those who should speak up, speak out. At this point, I would like to point out another aspect of Gombinski criticism. Who were those who didn't outcry, didn't protest and kept silence? Yes, it is, of course, the Judenrat, but not only. Gominski also addressed the Jewish intelligentsia, but he was a doctor of law. He is the intelligentsia, and still he used certain pers third person plural. Another thing is that one thing that Gombinski and other policemen agree about is that Chernyakov couldn't make decisions. Coincidence brought him to this, uh, to this position and he tried to keep everybody satisfied. He gave autonomy to some people, like Sharinsky, and let them gain too much influence. Chernyakov also illusioned himself that his policy and actions bring results. He tried to achieve small successes and didn't understand the Germans' intentions. Even moments before the deportation, he couldn't believe that the Germans had misled him. After, the, after he understood, he committed suicide. But what about the Jewish order service in this context? Gombinski tried to address the guilt as he imagined it, or at least to share it with others. We, the Jewish policemen, do not see any guilt in our behavior. Whose order were we to oppose? The Jewish council, did it give any sign? Was there any hint or even a protest on its part? Finally, did engineer Chenyakov did he say something, write something, any last will he left? Then who? The Jewish community? And where was it? Where were the political parties and those who had always pretend, pretended to be community leaders? They kept silent. It was not to be to these 2,000 people to transform themselves into the spiritual leaders of the Warsaw Jewry. As we can see in those quotes, Gombinski has some critics toward the Jewish public. However, he usually doesn't blame them and doesn't put their primary responsibility on them. The main issue that bothers Gombinski in this context is the optimism of many of the inhabitants of the ghetto. They can't believe that the rumors are true. For Gombinski, this is an example of their blind spot. He quotes a joke from the ghetto. In the Warsaw Ghetto, two Jews remained alive. The final liquidation of the ghetto takes place and both are to be ended. You see, says one to the other, this is the best evidence that everything is all right. What are you talking about? What is all right about this? Well, don't you understand? If they've condemned us to hang, it's a sign that they've run out of ammunition, that it's all coming to an end, that, is, that everything is all right. And Gominski adds, everything is all right. With some persistence and memorization, people repeated these two words at every turn. Here is it. But Gombinski uh, didn't separate himself and the public. 
He explained it. But all this we could not comprehend. We, people of the ghetto, could not understand. We could not guess the particular plan that had been uh, created to bring death. Sorry. Uh, unlike before, this time, Gombinski used first person plural, not third person. We could not guess. When he getting close to the end of his memoirs, Gombinski used the third first uh, person plural more and more. It's not a coincidence. That, uh, that he finished the first version of, of his memoirs, signing the date 22nd of July 1944, the second anniversary of the Great Deportation. One last uh, thing before I'll summarize, uh, Gombinski addresses a few times uh, Jewish history and its being. One of the most interesting examples is when he directly connects the deportation, the catastrophe, and the uprising, the kind of redemption. Gombinski claimed that the act of resistance was an almost um, natural continuation of the historical fate of the Jewish people. According to Gombinski, it could, it could not occur during the deportation because, and I quote, it was too early and too late at once. The Jews had to drink the whole cup. But what does it mean? It's a reference to the Bible, Isaiah chapter 51, it refers to this sentence, and the sentence continues uh, with this sentence, which means the people drank the cup of fury, and now the prophet promises that the misery will end. Let's continue. And this continuation means, but not only will suffering come to its end, but also the enemies of the people are those who will suffer now. So maybe Gombinski claimed that the policemen had a role in the divine fate of the Jewish people. They drank the cup and did terrible things, but the act of resistance or other aspects of redemption could not appear without it. To summarize, Gombinski, and I must add that it's not unique only uh, in his case, uh, among the policemen, uses discursive strategies of sharing the guilt. When it comes to actions that might be perceived negatively, he seeks to present himself as a Jewish um, as, and the Jewish order service as one of all. Many acted the same way. He sees guilt as a pie. The more one divides it, the smaller the pieces get. In addition, he asked us to, he asked us, uh, to see a broad context, whether it related to the Jewish public behavior or the Jewish nature throughout history. He himself and the Jewish policemen are not agents, according to Gombinski. They couldn't shape their life. They couldn't shape other life. Thank you. Thank you very much, and Noam, for your uh, really uh, detailed description of one uh, police officer. It gives us so much information uh, of, of the complexity of this uh, subject. We're talking about difficult histories. The Holocaust is a difficult history, but within that, uh, taking a look at what happened with the, the Jewish order and uh, the behaviors. We have so many questions. So I want to actually suggest that the questions that were posted during Katagina's uh, presentation actually are relevant to both of you. Um, I think I want to start with um, language that was used in uh, some of the questions. For example, uh, someone asked if the Jewish order was considered collaboration with the Germans. That's one part of the question. And of course that continues on, well, because of the, 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 the Judenrat and the, the, the Jewish order that the Jews were killed because of their cooperation, the collaboration, that was the process. So I think these two things go together and I wanna kind of maybe understand how you both see after your research, how would you describe uh, the Jewish order? Uh, especially when people still carry this understanding that they were collaborators, uh, that they had a, you know, uh, a choice. Uh, it came up in the um, chat. People said, well, they could have decided differently. They could have uh, chosen to not become a part of the uh, order police. And other people answered back in the chat, well, you know, 
you know, people are fearing the life of their um, themselves and their families, which is a third part of the question. Language, collaboration, were they collaborators? Could we consider them a part of the mechanism, uh, the Nazi mechanism that without them, the Jews wouldn't have been killed? Because that's, that's kind of the question here uh, as being collaborators. And thirdly, the third part is from the questions is, were there other reasons besides maybe a fear for their family and for themselves that may have uh, led specific people to become a part of the Jewish order? Someone mentioned maybe the alert to, to power. Uh, Kajina, you said normalcy, which I really could understand. So these are three kind of questions that I put together into one big question, trying to put uh, the Jewish order into some sort of um, language that we can understand, not directly go collaboration, not directly go here or there, try to understand who they were. So I'm throwing those out to you, to both of you. So who wants to start? <laughs> I can start. But oh, uh, <laughs> you start. <laughs> uh, this is a great question. And I think one that really is at the heart of, of, this, uh, of this topic is uh, at what point the Jewish order service becomes considered by those around them to be a collaborationist organization. Is it already at the very beginning? Uh, does joining the Jewish order service means becoming a collaborator, at least in the eyes of the wider society, if not on one's own? And I would say no. I would definitely think that uh, at the point when the Jewish order service is being set up, it's considered to be on the level of working in the Judenrat. Working in Judenrat, I would not say, was considered widely to be a form of collaboration. It might be morally dubious, considered dubious by some, for example, by Manuel Ringelm, of course, by people who, have, who had very strong, let's say, moral standards in that sense and collaborated with the underground in various ways, were involved in the underground work. But was it? I wouldn't say it was considered a collaboration by wider society at that point. So the question is, when do you cross the line? Uh, and when does it become a collaborationist? Quote, unquote, of course, in the eyes of the community again, situation. Uh, and the second is how it's considered after the war and what is really, and I think that is an important uh, guiding point here, is, is the position of Jewish honor calls as the internal voice of the Jewish community after the war. So uh, <coughs> in that sense, Jewish uh, police as such is not considered a collaborationist organization because people who are members of the Jewish police are not automatically considered to be collaborators. Each case is individually um, uh, seen by the, by the Jewish honor code. The question I think that's key here is the one you mentioned of choice, of how much choice did someone have? How much, uh, how much, to what extent this was a choiceless choice? To what extent this was actually a genuine choice? How much agency did they have? How much, and I'm saying he because it's, of course, referring to men also, but in case of also, but how much agency they had, how much decisions they, uh, you know, how much, yeah, how much choice they had, basically. So that's the key element. And I think, uh, of course, there are also elements when it comes to the Jewish on the cause, it's a completely different story. And as we know, the judgment were also influenced by numerous other factors, and they were not flawless, and often actually possibly made decisions which we today found very questionable, if not wrong. But nonetheless, I think the issue, there is an issue of choice. And, um, and I would say the Jewish in case of the Jewish police, the vast majority of cases were uh, uh, judged positively after after the war. Definitely in case of Warsaw Ghetto, maybe not in all ghettos, but in Warsaw, definitely. Noam, do you think that uh, Gombinski also felt that, uh, I mean, he had a very interesting way of looking at what he was doing and his insight. Um, do you think he felt like a collaborator? that he actually facilitated or did he have uh, an explanation? I don't wanna say excuse, it's more explanation. Yeah, it's uh, his argumentation throughout all his uh, memoirs is like he think that other things, uh, think that he is collaborator and he claims he's not. And uh, he, he criticized sometimes specific policeman and he by the way he was put in trial twice after the war and he was uh, he was found uh, innocent but he also left poland 
so uh, I guess it wasn't so it wasn't enough to be innocent in uh, in trial I guess um, so I think I don't think he see himself as collaborator uh, each unless he, I think he would say that unless you see all the Jews as collaborators I mean because he wasn't he was just part of the public is not um, in unique position in his opinion. And I think specific Gominsky probably, according to what others say about him, was probably, it, I don't think he's the classic uh, uh, typecast of collaborator, not at all. Yeah. Um, uh, so some people, I wanna take the next step, of course, obviously if there are people are thinking of collaborators and facilitating, they also are making comparisons to the capo, for example. So some people are asking, can you make a comparison between the order police and uh, the capos, the functions that they had, the way they behave? Do you see a comparison or should we separate? I think they should be, I, mean, I think I know they should be separated. It's a completely different dynamics because right. here, as I said, there's an issue of family. There is an issue of quasi normal at least to begin with, let's say community, if we can say that, but it's some sort of communal dynamics, networks which are still passed on from before the war and are taking place in the Warsaw Ghetto. In the, in the camp, it's a completely different situation. Yeah. And they were also treated differently by uh, uh, by honor courts. And I, I would say that it was widely perceived after the war that Jewish policemen actually had the largest scope of choice when it comes to joining the police and remaining within the police and couples. That being a prisoner functionary was more of an issue of life and death, while actually more prisoner functionaries were sentenced by honor courts for showing particular brutality towards other prisoners than the ghetto policemen. So, so actually, it's, uh, someone, yeah, someone was actually asking that who picked the uh the order police because you said that you know there was some sort of choice but who who was making the decisions who was deciding i mean i remember you talking about you know how many there were in warsaw so who made the decision to have so many it, there was many but it was a massive community as well reaching almost half a million people so 2000 mm -hmm. policemen is really quite a realistic police force when it comes to uh, basically a large city that also ghetto was, if not even realistic, too small possibly. So it was uh, just uh, proportional to, this, to the size of the community and the needs of the, in no way was it actually enough, but nonetheless, it was appropriate, the large number of people. But it was also led by the fact, as I mentioned, that there were so many people who were interested in enjoying the Jewish order service because of the of protection from forced labor. But that, who's recruiting them physically? Physically, uh, that's actually a great question, something that's appearing over and over again, <laughs> because they are, Adam uh, Stanisław Szerinski, who, when he's um, elected to be the head of the Jewish order service, is most like, it is most likely an independent decision of the Judenrat, possibly with some input from the Polish police, but mm. it, that, there's no proof that there will be any input from the German authorities regarding, he was approved, of course, but there was he wasn't pushed into that position by the German authorities in any way whatsoever. By the Polish police, yes, but not by the German authorities. Uh, and then uh, the decision of, of choosing candidates from the thousands of people who are showing up is with him and with the uh, commission which he which he sets up. There's a superv supervision commission which, which he sets up. Uh, and as I said, as in reality, this means that people like Gombinski who have links with Sharinsky from before the war and friends of friends and friends of friends are being uh, admitted in the service. This, we have one testimony from one of the former policemen who says that half of his high school was in the Jewish police. He, he goes to a very prestigious uh, Polish actually high school from, uh, in the interval period. And he says that from his Jewish friends from high school, half of them were in the police. Because it is, I think, a pretty much a mechanism of friends bringing in friends. Really and in time, also people who are able to pay a bribe, which is a different sort of way of getting in. But mm. undoubtedly, that's what's happening. One of the things that you said, uh, Noam, someone asked a question about uh, if, if the order police ever were part of the underground, if they did any kind of you know, uh, social welfare work. And you started talking about that a little bit, that actually Gominski did have a connection 
with the underground, right? Were there other uh, others that you found that had that kind of uh, connection? Gumbinski didn't have uh, connections with the underground. Uh, there were policemen that were uh, also connected to the youth movements, to the <clears throat> to job uh, that were uh, mm -hmm. a part uh, of also the police kind of a uh, um, representative <laughs> from the uh, youth movement in the police and then underground. Um, not Gumbinski, I, not also, not any one of those who wrote after the war, except, well, there is a question regarding Vaum, mm. uh, whether he was or he wasn't, because Rachel Orbach, it's not exactly that underground, but Rachel Orbach said that he was help, he was helping to the to hide Ringendum, but it's, I don't know, it's problematic, maybe, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> uh, now Ringelum says different things and maybe other things are con uh, involved in this uh, issue. Um, so this is about Gombinski and General. And what was uh, another question? No, I, actually, it was between two things. It was either being in the underground or certain, working to help with social welfare. Yeah, social welfare, there was. Uh, they, for foreign, um, for example, and, and, um, without parents, I forgot the word. The word. Orphan. Orphans, yes. Uh, for orphans, they try to help, and the police uh, kind of uh, established a few places. But it also was uh, not always the public uh, liked the way it worked because they sometimes they actually took orphans um, with force to those places. And uh, Gombinski writes that. Uh, the public don't see that um, the help they give, they see only the policemen that take, uh, enforce the, this uh, child and take him to another place. Uh, but for, anyway, it wasn't the main thing they did. But, and I think it also doesn't mean a lot, even if they would, because also we know that 13, uh, the group uh, 13 is welfare, uh, and uh, it doesn't mean that they were uh, also uh, very good <laughs> reasons they had to do so. Thank you, Noam. I, I wanna just, because of the time, there's there's a question here and it's uh, Lawrence Langer, so I can't uh, ignore it. And I wanna connect it to uh, Henry Greenspan's question. So we have two uh, <laughs> scholars that have these questions. I think, first of all, maybe the question would be, um, how do we know who who was in the uh, order police? If you said the Shoah Foundation, they weren't asked the question, they weren't exposing it. So how did we find out about that? And did they expose themselves and at what point? And I think I wanna connect this to uh, Lawrence Langer's question because why do we spend so much time talking about the guilt or innocence of the Jews while barely examining the behavior of the really non-Jewish guilty ones, the Germans and their allies and collaborators. By the way, we did that in our series from January about uh, marking 80 years of the uh, Banzi Conference. So we did discuss that over four different uh, programs. So you're all invited to listen to that. But I think basically we are talking about a difficult history that is talked about. But the questions are meshed together between uh, Greenspan and Langer. How do we discover or dig up this information when you're saying that maybe they didn't want to talk about this in interviews. And I want to compare this to other things, sort of, you know, sexual abuse, uh, Jewish humor, other things that were discovered later on in uh, research. And why do we deal so much with the Jewish police, the Judenrat, the order police? The floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. And I now feel like, a like I'm in high school and I know the answer. So it's very exciting. Uh, <laughs> we know because there's a list of the Jewish policemen, firstly, in the Jewish Circle Institute archive, a list from uh, late 1940 mm. from the Office of the Jewish Service with the names of a thousand policemen with their addresses and service numbers. Of course, as I said, the number fluctuates. People were leaving, people were dying, others were brought in. But nonetheless, we have this basic list. That's the first thing. The second one, uh, of course, they didn't want to talk about in the Shah Foundation uh, interviews, but immediately after the war, numerous Jewish policemen actually addressed the uh, 
honor court in Poland asking for rehabilitation because of the stigma of the Jewish policeman that was with them. And that includes also people who are cleared by the Polish state courts, who are tried in Poland on the August degree as collaborators, quote unquote, were cleared by the Polish state court and nonetheless again addressed the Jewish honor court in Warsaw, getting or attempting to get the clearing of the name in the eyes of the community. Many of them did it just before immigration because they didn't want to be hunted by this stigma of the Jewish policeman. Of course, as we know, this didn't work necessarily. The stigma remained, but nonetheless, they wanted themselves to clear the names. So a lot of the surviving uh, Jewish policemen from Warsaw actually had not were not necessarily denounced, but themselves addressed the court asking for the name um, to be cleared. And yeah, that's it. And what was the other well, issue? Was that was all, connected to the second question. Why do we care why so we much? So much with uh... and that's a fantastic question and. That's a question which actually I kept asking myself, like, why do people care? And of course, there's a whole issue of crimes within the community, intimate violence and crimes from one's own community hurting the most. But I think a key element here is that no type of justice against the other two groups could be achieved after the war. No justice against Germ, at least attempted justice, even whatever we call it, uh, retribution against the Germans could have been achieved in any way whatsoever by the Jewish community, other than a few attempts that we know of or those few, but nonetheless, in general, nothing resembling justice could have been achieved. And similarly, as we know from now growing number of works on uh, the trials of Polish perpetrators after the war, no true justice could be achieved against local collaborators. So the only group against which some sort of, I think, structured attempts at getting justice could be achieved by individual members of the Jewish community was for the network of honor courts. And that was, those were the quote unquote collaborators. That was the only way where some sort of, I don't know how to call it, but the feeling of justice maybe could have been achieved. And I think that's something that plays a very important part in this. Yeah, I agree. And I think it's important for us to be able to discuss this if we're asking again, why? Because someone else is trying to distort what the narrative is. So mm -hmm. I'm just gonna add that in quickly. Uh, Noam, do you wanna give a take? From your experience? Um, I think that um, first, I think we try to understand how people act and react in extreme situations. And this is extreme situation. And we are trying, at the end, when we are doing the history, not only the Holocaust, we are asking questions about ourselves, our life, our future, and not only about our specific, very specific past. So this is one thing. And the other is, um, it's very interesting. It's another subject, like I won't um, talk about it, uh, full of it, but the, it's interesting that the policemen address the future readers uh, right. a few times. Gombinski and Adler and Varm, and also if you're looking to Otvotsk, it's uh, Perchodnik, they writing to somebody us. mentioned somebody mentioned that we should read his memoir as well. So yes, thank yeah, you for and, mentioning that. Yeah, and um, and but they're writing to us. They want us to read them, to read what they wrote. Of course, Little Son submitted is uh, uh, what he wrote to Ringelung Archive. So mm -hmm. of course, okay. it's also written. Actually, we are the um, audience. So I think it's uh, kind of um, makes sense that we try to read and try to comprehend them. Um, but on the other side, I think they write to us, they declare that they want us to understand what they've been through, but at least from the policemen I read, they don't really share what they feel, what they think. The argumentation is very, very, um, it's uh, taken, uh, took over on the uh, personal memoirs, uh, which is also very interesting phenomenon uh, about writing during extreme uh, times in general. Thank you so much. I think that with that, we're gonna end because we could continue uh, and continue, <laughs> but, and there's still more questions coming in as we speak. Um, but I wanna thank you both again. Uh, this series is really trying to deal with the different ways that we understand what happened during the uh, Great Deportation. It's a very complex situation and we're trying to look at it from different angles. I think this program was probably one of the most uh, difficult 
because we are dealing with something that maybe you know reflects you know what the Jewish community thought of itself and uh, how it was actually uh, acting and making choices, choices, choices. Somebody said um, in uh, in in the Warsaw Ghetto, and so I want to thank you for your presentations and thank you for being a part of the uh, series. And I want to turn to the audience once again and thank you for coming again. And for those of you who are just joining us for the first time for joining this series, and I hope that you continue to join us. Uh, everyone